I don't think there's going to be too many surprises today. Any day on the bike is a good day. Well, these don't appear to be as road-like as we expected. That was not a road. It's going to be a good day, though. We are having derailleur problems out here in no man's land. I can handle whatever nature wants to throw at me on this day. And what about whatever Riker wants to throw at you? Whatever Riker wants to throw at me, whether it be appropriate or not, um, I may or may not be able to handle. So my buddy Chris Reichert has been talking my ear off for the better part of a year about this legendary gravel ride down in the Carrizo Plain of Central California. Over 100 miles of mostly gravel roads, some paved sections, and some, well, who knows, completely uncharted territory that we wanted to go explore for ourselves. And if you haven't heard of the Carrizo Plain, it's truly breathtaking. It's a national monument. And it's this immense grassland plain, the largest in California, by the way, uh, which turns green and absolutely blows up with a wildflower super bloom in the springtime, um, which we barely missed on this trip, by the way. It's, uh, it's straddled by these two mountain ranges with a depression right in the middle that collects all the, the rainwater runoff and forms Soda Lake, which is totally bizarre because there's actually no water in the, in the Soda Lake at all. It, it all evaporates and forms this thick, ultra-fine powdery clay deposit. It's like a moonscape. Um, so Chris had this 100-mile loop mapped out, which would bring us through the central plain, across the moonscape, up and over both mountain ranges, and finally loop back around to the campsite where it started. It was Chris's intention to break me in my one-hour crit fitness, but the problem is he's never done this route before, and from what we gathered, nobody had done this route before. So we were both going into this thing a little bit blind. And also, it's worth mentioning, I don't have any experience riding gravel. Hell, I don't even have a gravel bike or shoes. So I reached out to some friends over at Ventum, built up their beautiful GS1 on super short notice, which I didn't even have a chance to ride before throwing it onto Reichert's truck rack and driving south, where we met up with our buddy and third rider in this adventure, Christopher Strickland. And that's where we set up camp. Whoever thought we would have been on an adult sleepover How's the Snuggie working snug, out for you? The Snuggie's working out really well. <laughs> like, packed so perfectly, but I was like, wait, there's no way. That does look packed very well. I was like... <laughs> no, they just had an enormous wooden cross out to, outside of their front house. Like, very cold looking cross. Oh boy. We dripping. I have new shoes. I have a new bike, and it's a new discipline in the sport, on a new course, and I'm just going full send, 104 miles. Yeah, I'd be nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. It's just going to be like a crit, but five of them in a row. I am literally, I'm stuck with my pocket stuck on this bike, and I, I feel like the scene in Ace Ventura where I'm coming out of a rhino's ass. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody help him. Actually, let's go. Let's get a head start. Chris! We're rolling, he's stuck! on a gravel bike right now, so as you'll notice, he's behind us. We're gonna try to do our best to keep him there all day. We got 104 miles, a guy with a brand new bike and a brand new pair of shoes. I'm gonna bet this is gonna get pretty rough for the rest of the day. Stay tuned. I've been riding dirt for about two years, so, you know, I can, I can handle myself a little bit. I don't think there's gonna be too many surprises today. So, so far it's been nice and flat and smooth. A couple of washboards, but nothing crazy. 
So the first 10 miles were basically the easiest of the entire ride. Gentle tailwind, rolling terrain, and relatively smooth gravel roads. But that didn't last very long. Uh, once we turned off the main gravel road to cross the valley and to cross the moonscape, we quickly realized there was going to be a big problem. About 20 meters into the dried lake bed, our bikes were already sinking down into the clay so far that our pedals and derailers were scraping the surface. Not to mention, it, it was taking about 400, 450 watts just to go fast enough not to tip over, like, like we're talking walking speed. And it was only getting worse the closer to the center of the lake that we got. Uh, once it got to the point where our pedals were hitting the ground every single rotation, we stopped and called it. And once we stopped, the bikes sink even lower because now we're not moving anymore, right? So um, like we're talking down to the bottom brackets to the point where you could just get off your bike and it, would, it wouldn't tip over. It would just sit there stuck in the clay. So that's when we decided, okay, plan B, let's turn around, go back to the main road and cross the valley a little bit further south. And that's when we hit the first and very steep climb of the day. Strickland here, member of Photo Pace, hanging out with uh, these two hooligans back there, <coughs> Jeff and Chris. Just stoked to be on pavement. Hopefully, no more big climbs for an hour or so. Riker and uh, Jeff showed their uh, physical fortitude over me already. They've already dominated me once on this ride. I expect it to happen a couple more times, but uh, I'd be happy if we could take a little break. Mark Nam. So that little break that Christopher was looking forward to actually ended up being one of the fastest parts of the entire ride. I mean, we really stepped on it. Because we had to, think about it. At this point, we had a failed attempt at the moon crossing <laughs> and the climb was way steeper and looser gravel than any of us had expected. So we were pretty far behind schedule and had to make up time pretty quickly. Meanwhile, Jordan, our photographer and videographer, he went up the road to check out the next and by far most difficult section, the final and massive climb through unexplored territory. But unfortunately, he was met with a locked and completely impassable gate, plus a do not cross sign. <laughs> so we may have a few more miles down the road to stuff our faces with rice cakes, top off our water bottles, and to talk about options for completing the rest of the ride. Look at that, bacon in there. That was in the freezer for roughly a year and a half. So we might, we might struggle later. <laughs> All right, so we got a serious problem because Jordan, our driver, our videographer, he cannot pass through the rest of the loop in his truck. And we didn't really expect that. So we are gonna have to brave it alone. And I think they're gonna meet us on the other side. But we have arguably the hardest section of road where we're gonna be unsupported. And it is a pretty treacherous climb and a pretty wicked descent. And we actually don't even know half of it because nobody's seen these roads. So we're gonna sneak through on our bikes. They're not gonna be there in the truck and we're, we have radios, they're not gonna make it. So we're gonna send it. And unless you're the cops, then we're not. We are, <laughs> if, you're, if you're the ranger, we are gonna get in the car and they're gonna drive us around to where it's safe. <laughs> right? The do not, the do not, do not pass sign is a suggestion, not a rule, right? That's the art of gravel ride, man. <laughs> Well, well, we'll see what we can do. Um, I might, it might be the end of the road for me. Um, are, you, are you starting to starting to feel the miles? Starting to feel the miles a little bit. Um, the the legs are the legs are feeling it. Fitness is not on par with you, hammerheads, but <laughs> that's, that's totally okay. Well, this is the moment, right? Because, like I said, they're going the opposite direction, and we're going into uncharted territory. So uh, we got to figure that out right now, and maybe have one of Chris's rice cakes, and we'll think about it. Yeah. No. Go on without oh, me. Man. Go on without me. All right, dude. We'll see you on the top. Yeah. Now I can race Jeff, though. Later, right. nerds. I'll be off the jerk. Nerds. 
So Reichert and I parted ways with the support truck, which was now going the other direction, the long way back around. And after another 10 or 15 miles of hard riding, we started looking for that lock gate with a do not cross sign. And that's when our problems first started. All right. So a little snafu, I think Chris accidentally loaded the wrong map onto his Wahoo. So um, we're gonna hop this fence and we're gonna send it. Hopefully this is the right one. <laughs> Let's go climb a hill, Chris. Let's do it. So this wasn't the right fence. <laughs> of course, we didn't know this at the time, but we were hopping the wrong gate and getting on the wrong path. Because remember, if you look back at the footage that Jordan took an hour or two earlier when he was unsuccessfully trying to get through this gate in his truck, it's actually a totally different gate. So this would spell trouble later on, but in this moment, we were pretty confident that we were going the right way and just decided to go for it. So with no cell reception, GPS or map, one flat repair kit, and with only the food we had in our pockets and the water we had in our bottles, we just pointed our bikes in the right direction into the unknown and committed ourselves to getting up and over this mountain which seemed fine for the first five or so miles of climbing until we reached a second fence, which is better than a dead end, I suppose, but not really an encouraging sign that we were on the right path to the top, where we would eventually meet Jordan. But before we even got to the fence, my derailleur started skipping and making all these crazy noises. Um, most importantly, it prevented me from getting into those bigger climbing gears, which at this point I desperately needed. Not that big of a deal under normal conditions, but out here in the middle of nowhere with no cell reception, limited food and water, you just want everything to be running perfectly and to avoid all mechanical mishaps. We are having derailleur problems out here in no man's land. A little bit stressful, not gonna lie. So we got back on the road after fixing the derailleur, or at least adjusting it so I could get into those big climbing gears. But before we even hit the main climb, we were faced with this string of short but brutally steep hills. I am doing unnecessarily hard efforts up these little climbs. Yes. Yeah, I can. I'll pass to that. <laughs> I'm going to pay for it because we got a big one coming up. After those, we had a short descent, which was a relief on one hand, but on the other, I was starting to stress out a little bit because the road quality at this point had really started to deteriorate. I mean, it went from a proper maintained gravel road to a poorly maintained fire road to a footpath almost completely taken back by nature. And then finally, we were basically just pointing our bikes in the direction of the top of the mountain Riding when possible, but mostly just walking. Um, and, and walking because riding just wasn't an option. It was so incredibly steep and loose. And I'm not gonna lie, at this point, in the back of my mind, I was a little worried about how much food and water we had left. I was worried about getting lost. Actually, on second thought, I wasn't really worried about getting lost because we were already lost. <laughs> we were just marching uphill as quickly as we could. And after about two and a half hours of this, I heard the most glorious sound I've ever heard, you guys. The droney boy overhead, which meant that we were finally getting close to Jordan and the top of the mountain. How do you guys feel about your decision-making today? You know, I won't, I won't lie. I'm tired right now. <laughs> uh, I mean, we still have 20 miles to go, but there was a point with which we were, I mean, just flat out just walking up a, a mountainside. Like, there was no trail anymore, and like, we were complaining about the road commissioner, let's get him out here! This really needs to be repaved, I think. It was slow enough, as we were hiking biking, that Chris's Wahoo was like, hey, right. you've, you've stopped, we, we you need to keep moving. We weren't moving. <laughs> we're going so slow, my ride is paused. It's like, hey. You're not moving. Why aren't you guys going faster? And he was pointing at stuff like this right here, and Chris is like, that's that's our path. That's what we need to go up. That's how we get up there. And we just we just sent it. And uh, I gotta be honest, there were a couple of moments where I was like, this is a little bit terrifying because my derailleur's clicking around and I think I have a bent hanger. And we think we have one patch, one one flat kit, and uh, yeah. Oh, we made it. We made it. Oh, we made it. 
like you need a beer, buddy. There's pocket rice. <laughs> Let me tell you, if you're gonna eat a rice cake, you want one that's been in your pocket unwrapped. Smushed. And smushed. Sweaty. That's the best way. You get that extra you salt. Know, I think it's nice to have the texture. What water? Or is there any, uh, <sighs> that's pretty good. My dogs are barking a little bit, Chris. That hike a bike kind of took a toll. The new shoes may have been a bad idea today. God oh, damn it! Boo! Hold on. I... Reset. <laughs> There's no hold on. You lost your chance. All right, you want to go? Mm hmm. Go for All right, you're in. I'll, I'll... <gasps> All right, fine. More like a six out of ten. So with over 20 miles left to ride, it was time to hit the road, completely empty the tank and go full gas to see if we could beat the sun on our way back to the campsite. Beautiful light I've potentially ever seen. 